Why did you accept the Mobilize Forum offer to look at uh, virtual mobility and notably the way refugees use smartphones? When they left their homes, of course they have to grab their clothes, shoes, and they always all have had a phone, mm. a smartphone. So even in the boat, in the danger, before they, they are really sunken down or drowned, they're still calling. Uh, either to to ask uh, to, uh, to rescue them or to report their location to to their home or to the people they care about. And once they arrived, the first thing they do is to to dial the phone to tell hmm. the loved ones they arrived. And during the whole journey, every day, in every camp, the, you see people uh, set up this kind of station just to recharge the phone. or be dozens of phones or hundreds of phones there or in any location when they see has uh, some electricity, they will start charging the phone. And uh, they, they communicate with uh, People at home, also people already in, in their destination, could be Germany or, or other places, uh, Sweden or you know other places. So that's the way, that's a line of their lifeline, you know, that's mm. only hope and only comfort and only connection to a, to a real world, and uh, so that's very uh, precious for them. Mimi, your work examines the question of uh, mobility justice, mobile communication, uh, and shows that mobilities uh, both uh, reveal and produce inequalities. Is that the reason why you were interested in uh, commenting on and discussing Iwayway's work? Uh, I was always interested in how mobile communication was changing the way people move around the world, how they connect to information and to each other, to urban space in different ways. And I was also interested in migration and borders. And when I saw your work, I thought immediately, this brings it together in a way that you don't see very often, the communication context and the refugee crisis and the border crossing. And I had learned how important that was when I was working in Haiti after the earthquake because I saw all the responders coming in with very good communication systems and yet Haitians who were displaced and were struggling to get their life back on their feet, they didn't have as much technology. But you saw those who had phones, uh, it was so important mm -hmm. and they always needed to find electricity to keep them charged and that was a uh, for me, raised this question about humanitarianism and refugees and mobile communication technology. And it's, uh, for me, a mobility justice issue because there's inequalities um, all the time in everyday life, and then there's inequalities globally in mm -hmm. how people connect together. Yeah, yeah distribution of information is really a, a human rights issue, I think. Um, in the, on the shore, when people doing rescue, they have a, such an uh, advanced system. They can locate the people in the ocean and they start can communicate because the coastline is so long. They can organize uh, the, the bus, the, the doctors to, to, to be on the location right away. Sometimes 30 boats coming at the same time in different directions. And, uh, they need a lot of uh, um, a lot of effort, uh, social effort, to to even just distribute those people and to 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 put, give them the first uh, comfort is is quite difficult. But uh, the uh, volunteers, they all very knowledgeable in social media and. Uh, 
everything organized uh, very well. It's very impressive. You know. Yeah, but important, I think, to recognize that refugees themselves want to connect and have communication and information, as you said, and mm. sometimes I think the experts don't always sh share that. You know, when they just out of a boat, they must be calling their relatives to say they're safe. Yeah, we did some translation. We found out they're, they're talking about they're safe, or, or sometimes they receive calls, they don't know where they are. They just say we're hiding north, we don't know where. Or, or they, they, they try to respond to see their situation, how bad the situation is, or how disappointed they are. And also they communicate about uh, how to make the next move. Because the, the journey like this, the worst thing is not lacking of uh, support, uh, material support. Mm -hmm. The worst thing is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mobile phone gives them a chance to, to still have uh, some connection with uh, necessary uh, information. And uh, even just trying to communicate with uh, smugglers mm. or to, to tell the people they're on the way, what is the possibility and uh, you know, all those issues. But of course the phone uh, images from, uh, can be on the boat, can be uh, on the camps, or in police station, or in all kind of conditions, but they always have their phone on. When there is no camera, the power really act uh, very ruthlessly you know, the police, when there's no camera. It's so strange. They would act, uh, they would behave very, very differently. But when there's camera, when you're yelling out, the world is watching, then they, it calms them down a little bit. Hmm. It's just like that. It's everywhere. It's not in China or in France or, it's everywhere. The power always act and, uh, ruthlessly when there's no, no Nobody watching, you know. Yeah, <laughs> like you have the the video of the um, young men filming the border guards. Is it at the Greek Macedonian border? Oh yeah. And you yeah, feel yeah. like they too are standing up to the power of the government and sort of saying we are recording this. So even if the injustice happens, there's a record of it happening. Don't you think that the smartphones uh, are a very powerful tool for them to, to overcome the fact that their physical movement is, is very often blocked, as we can see in your, in your videos and pictures? Don't you think that, in a way, the, the virtual mobility allows them to well, maybe to, to, to move again. Yes, yeah, so once uh, uh, a camp, uh, and the one who maintains the camp said, very, very strange, uh, was in German, in the camp in Berlin. He tell, tell me a story, he said, um, yesterday they all said they want to go to Berlin, but Today, when we start to register, question them, they all said they will go to Sweden. So how could this happen so, so fast? I think they have their networks. Mm -hmm. They can easily just send out one note, you know, to tell the situation changed, or is about uh, the border or locations, and uh, then they all get it. So in Edomini, you see, when there are a lot of engineers in there, there's a lot of uh, very capable middle-class uh, people. And uh, they immediately set up this kind of network uh, to 
to inform each other. Human basically act, uh, the part is very much like an animal or like a birds. You don't want to just fly by yourself. You want it to be a group, you know, to be, it, it seems always safer and, uh, and uh, less danger. Hmm. It totally changes the landscape. You know, they are no longer individuals. They are become a movement. Uh, you know, we call them refugees. You know, that's also we already put them in one group. Mm. Even they're they're different. Where it could be doctors or could be uh, 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 teachers. They could be very different position. And but we all call them uh, refugees. But they, they share the same kind of status, uh, but also uh, they, they share the fundamental understanding about safety and uh, where would lead them, what would be most efficient path, and who to whom they should trust. And all those very necessary information in our life. And uh, yeah, it completely changed the, the understanding. You know, when when you see media says, "Oh, thousands of children are disappeared in Germany," I don't think they disappeared. I think they are they are, they have their own channels, their own way of handling things. You, it's just uh, two different channels. You you don't you don't know. You know, authority doesn't know. You know what's going on. And, uh, and because the different language, different kind of, uh, uh, you don't have, you don't build that enough trust for people to share the information, or you don't even uh, give this kind of respect. Everybody would uh, seeking for safety or want to have a better future. And though, then you always see them as a foreign, so. There's never a chance to build a trust. Then, of course, the consequence is not uh, very uh, pleasant. It's not going to be a very bright future. Whenever we, we, we don't have a trust in another human being, you know. I think th this video is also very interesting. The video where we see a man tuning his guitar with uh, his friend, uh, with uh, an app on his uh, smartphone. Uh, and I feel that uh, smartphone is much, perhaps much more than, uh, than just a tool to communicate, but in this situation, isn't it a tool also to, to get human dignity? Just not, not to communicate, but just to... Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tool to defense, to defense the very essential values of uh, seeking freedom, seeking safety, seeking to be yourself, to to relate to another person who understands your value and speaks the same language. So, yeah, I, I think that is definitely whatever we think is so close to us, we think it's so necessary, it all, always reflects the human dignity. Why human wants communication so much? Besides all the, you know, uh, economic reasons, the very essential, um, profound, it's trying to, to see who you are and uh, to, to, to see uh, through other people's eye. And uh, especially on this kind of condition, when you have to lose your land, your neighborhood, your language, your religion, everything you're familiar with, the only thing you can attach to is the one who shares same kind of experience with you also have to give up everything. You know, you, you look at him, you know everything. You understand, you know, you, you can associate this with images you see in 40 years ago, 60 years ago, mm. or as long as there's clear image being recorded, you can associate, you see that kind of image in the history, people being uh, refused people being badly treated or mistreated. And uh, you see so much fear in their eyes in those photos. Mm. I think the fear most come from uncertainty. They don't know what will be the next. Mm. 
and for those refugees today, it's so much better because they have the, the smartphone. You know, they can, even in the most difficult time, they still can have someone who has successfully made the journey or someone in their home to tell them you have to, you have to really uh, not come back. Here's no place for you to stay, you know, to give them some courage. The transformations that have happened in physical mobility are that we are now able to at least have this virtual connection to a community that we're moving with or kind of trying to hold together as we move. Mm -hmm. I think in the past, people used to do that by choosing particular locations. There were migration chains where they knew somebody from their village was in a particular town in a foreign country and they would go to that place. So there were ways in the past to sort of try to keep those connections, but they were much more distantiated mm. and harder to maintain, I think. Yeah, it's true. Because in the, in the iPhone communication, you can have all the instructions, all the carrying maps, the road, the past, the time, the weather condition. Mm. And uh, you, you know everything about another person and uh, you can communicate so well. And uh, this is uh, life kind of like uh, walking through a video game. <laughs>